afternoon. Hello. Uh, welcome to the third um, webinar in this series that we're doing with um, the CME. My name is Mark. I'm head of risk at APM Capital. Um, APM Capital is a broker headquartered and regulated in Abu Dhabi. Uh, we connect um, our clients to the world's larger derivatives exchanges, um, and there's none much larger than the CME. We're very pleased to um, have David Gibbs with us uh, today, who's going to be um, doing this third webinar. Uh, David is a Director of Education at the CME Group. Um, he's a market professional with over 40 years of industry experience, um, starting out in the open outcry pits um, on the Chicago Futures Exchanges. He's held leadership positions um, with global FCMs and has actively traded futures options and cash market products for buy and sell side firms. Um, he's an expert in pricing um, derivatives and um, he's a noted teacher in the application of futures and options and is in regular contact with asset managers, hedge funds, uh, prop trading firms and banks around the world. Uh, we're very pleased to have him um, do this presentation with us. Um, the presentation itself should last around 45 to 50 minutes. Um,
Hi, David. Can you hear us? I can hear you. I just turned my microphone on. Can you hear me, Hitachi? Yes, we can hear you. Brilliant. Um, we sent you everything. Oh, sorry. Hi, David. We sent you everything. Hi, Maria. Today. Good. Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to attempt to just share my screen. Did you receive the presentation that we sent you today along with the agenda a couple of hours ago today morning? Hmm, I probably have just a minute. Okay. Do, do I need to add something for today's program? Yeah, I mean, I just gave you like first and last slides because last. OK, time just a second. OK, let me get out of here then. Got a few minutes. We can do that right now. Um, Let's get out of there. Ah, here they are. Okay, just a second. Oh, um, wait a minute. Great. Let's see. Is this, this is the, is this the first one? Yes, there we go. Okay. So we want to put this at the top. Yeah. Yep. And the last one will be for the Q&A. Okay. Copy. And then we'll put this down at the bottom. Hmm. There. Uh, save. Okay, now that's good. That's good. Now let's see if we've done this correctly. I'm going to, uh, I want this one. Let me know if that's come up full screen. Yes, perfect. Thank you. And I can advance. I'm, I'm advancing and you can see the, the, the changes. Yes. Perfect. And that's full screen. Brilliant. All right, then we'll wait for Mark's introductions. Mark, I'll wait for you to introduce, uh, introduce me, but we've got uh, we've got a few minutes yet. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Hi guys, sorry, I was just having some some issues joining on on Teams, but looks like you are all sorted. Um, and David, you are good to go. Indeed, thank you. Good luck. Thanks, guys. And also, just um, just so you know, I've got Flavia on the call, um, who is my maternity cover. So any online events going forward, she'll be she'll be the point of contact. Um, I think she's only as oh she is as a presenter, so she can meet, yeah, unmute herself and say hello. Yes. Yeah, I can. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, Hitachi, do we know how many people yep. have registered for this event? Um, I'll be right back. Second. I yeah, of course, David. I Early think it's 33. I was checking today in the morning. Okay, that's three. sounding good. Yeah. Perfect. Um, well, yeah, make sure if you, if you could send us final numbers um, over after the event, that would yeah. be great. Yeah, of course, we'll send after. Perfect. Thanks, guys.
All right.
Okay, guys, are we all ready? Good, we're gonna admit people and we can start. Good afternoon, hello. Uh, welcome to the third um, webinar in this series that we're doing with um, the CME. My name is Mark, I'm Head of Risk at APM Capital. Um, APM Capital is a broker headquartered and regulated in Abu Dhabi. Uh, we connect um, our clients to the world's larger derivatives exchanges um, and there's none much larger than the CME. We're very pleased to um, have David Gibbs with us uh, today who's going to be um, doing this third webinar. Uh, David is uh, Director of Education at the CME Group. Um, he's a market professional with over 40 years of industry experience, um, starting out in the open outcry pits um, on the Chicago Futures Exchanges. He's held leadership positions um, with global FCMs and has actively traded futures options and cash market products for buy and sell side firms. Um, he's an expert in pricing um, derivatives and um, he's a noted teacher in the application of futures and options and is in regular contact with asset managers, hedge funds, uh, prop trading firms and banks around the world. Uh, we're very pleased to have him um, do this presentation with us. Um, the presentation itself should last around 45 to 50 minutes. Um, during that time, if you have any questions, please pop them into the chat and we will have um, some time at the end and, and David will be able to answer your individual questions. So um, thanks again for joining us and um, over to you, David. Are uh, you still on mute, David? Mark, can you hear me now? Yes, loud and clear. Thank you. OK, is the presentation still up? Uh, we're seeing PowerPoint as a application. We're not in slideshow mode at the moment. OK, let, let me um, I'm going to stop and come back in just a second. I don't know what happened there, but we lost. We lost something. Okay. Hopefully okay. we're back up in full presenter mode and you can hear me. That's correct. Yep. Thanks, okay, David. Off brilliant. You, off you go. Thank you very much. Thank you for that introduction, Mark. Welcome, everyone. We're going to be talking in today's uh, workshop about a very important uh, segment or sesh, section of uh, the futures and options market, which relates to spreads. Uh, it, this is a, a corner of the world that is uh, very close to my heart as I did a lot of work and still do a lot of work with uh, the relative value relationships between futures contracts. And also uh, should note that in the options world at CME, about 70% of our options volume is done, is, is, is executed as some form of a spread trade, sometimes with two legs, sometimes as many as six uh, or eight. So it it's an important concept to grasp. We're gonna be, as mentioned, take about 45 minutes to go through uh, the program. And then of course, take any questions that you have. Uh, I'd like to begin as usual by stating that our time together is meant to be educational and informative and is in no way meant to be construed as offering investment advice nor making trading recommendations. You're certainly going to see examples of trades, uh, spread trades in the presentation, but that should not be construed as investment advice or, or recommendations. 
quick a quick review uh, who we are and what we do. CME Group is, as mentioned, a large global derivatives exchange. Uh, we're probably the largest futures exchange and clearing operation for futures and options in the world. And we cover a wide array of asset classes with leading benchmark products that cover uh, areas in agricultural commodities as well as industrial, uh, including crude and refined oil products as well as natural gas. Our metals business takes in both base and precious metals, uh, gold, silver, platinum, palladium, as well as copper and aluminum. Uh, in our financial products, we have everything from foreign exchange markets, interest rate markets, as well as equity index markets. We also have some rather specialized or esoteric uh, products like cryptocurrencies, uh, real estate indices, and even weather futures. So it's it's a broad base of diversified products that the, the world turns to for managing their risk and looking for trading opportunities. Uh, as we mentioned in our last presentation together, we, we talked about ne the need to create a balanced marketplace and to include as many participants as possible. This is designed to both balance risk, but also to create deep pools of actionable liquidity which speeds and aids the two primary functions of the exchange, which are price discovery, which is enhanced by having as many participants and points of view involved as possible. And then this important risk transfer function from people that want to sell risk to people that are willing to buy it. Those are the two main purposes of CME's exchange traded business. And then of course, the other third is the post-trade risk management functions of the clearinghouse. Now, getting into things here, futures as a, as a tool are very, very useful in this risk management function, but their uh, function from, from a long or a short position is rather linear. If you go long a futures contract and that market goes up in price, you benefit from that price action. But if you're long a futures position and the market goes down, it, it has negative consequences on the position. And it's pretty straightforward. If, you, if you're long and it's up, you win. If you're long and it's down, it's bad. Uh, but you can also just as easily short futures contracts. You don't necessarily always have to sell what you own. You can create a net short position by selling futures, which is one of their distinctive advantages. But like the long position, the short position has a linear benefit. If you're short and the market goes down, Hooray, you, you make money. Uh, if you're short and the market goes against you, you lose money. So it's this linear relationship that sort of defines futures as a trading tool, which in and of itself is certainly useful. It's, it's, it's a way to lay off risk or, or to create different risks um, using the futures contracts. What a spread is in the futures business is simply the simultaneous buying and selling of two futures contracts. This is known as a spread, uh, a, a long, short position. It's done simultaneously. Uh, they can be uh, positioned in such a way as to be uh, somewhat dollar neutral. There could be strategic reasons for wanting to put on a spread. There could also be more practical uh, operational reasons for using a spread. In the case of uh, a, a spread where you're trading between two distinctly different products, Depending on their degree of price correlation, there might even be some uh, margin offsets to that net long short position, because if you're long a, one product and short another highly correlated product, it stands to reason that there could be uh, some risk mitigation implied in the spread and lower risk in the case of CME clearings uh, view may result in a lower margin requirement. Uh, we'll be talking about that a little bit further on in our discussion. There's two main types of spreads, or as, as we identify them in, in our world at CME Group. One are, are, are intra-commodity spreads. These are also referred to as calendar spreads because they refer to spreads within a specific product but the spread is between two different expiration months of that product. Uh, examples of this could be something like uh, a, a spread in, in, uh, in equities, a, a long position in December S&Ps and a short position in a March contract. Uh, it can be done for uh, what I would call uh, operational purposes. A calendar spread is also an example of what's used, you, it, the term is used to roll a position forward. 
uh, as you guys remember, uh, futures contracts are not assets. They have expiration dates, they're price points in time. So as we approach a contract's expiration date, if the person that's in that position wants to maintain a risk position in that particular futures product, they're going to have to roll that position forward in time because the, the, the clock is gradually running out on their open position. And in order to maintain a position, they're gonna to have to deal with the expiring contract. Very, very few of the open interest in our products goes all the way to expiration. Most of the futures positions in our main markets do this. They, they roll forward prior to expiration because the people that are using those contracts for hedging and for trading purposes want to maintain that exposure. So rather than having to offset one leg and, uh, and then in a separate transaction, create the new trade in a back month contract, you execute that in what's known as a calendar spread or a roll trade. We're gonna talk about those in just a minute. The other type of spread is inter-commodity. Now, this refers to a long short spread position between two different products. And there could be, again, lots of different reasons to want to apply this trading strategy as well. Um, this refers to uh, the rolling of a contract. I will, as we approach last trading day, or in many cases, well before last trading day, uh, people with open positions are going to want to roll their positions forward. Now, it's important to be mindful in, in, in the case of a roll, what affects the timing of that particular roll. For our contracts that are physically settled or have a delivery mechanism like commodities, uh, treasury futures, swaps, and even some of our foreign currency or FX contracts, the first day of delivery, a potential delivery, which is known as first position day, has an impact on the timing of the roll or when the bulk of that open interest goes from a near-term expiring contract into uh, a deferred contract. Because that open interest, if they're long on first position day, is exposed to a potential delivery. Now, if they wanted to accept delivery, they could remain long in that contract. The short position always dictates the timing of, uh, of, of the delivery mechanism. But if the long position does not want the physical uh, commodity or, or contract uh, requirements, then they must have be, be out of that position prior to first position day. So with a cash settled contract, Expiration uh, and the role is, is less dramatic because you're not getting any physical delivery. Uh, so cash settled futures contracts like the uh, equity index futures, our short term interest rate products, uh, th that role usually takes place closer to the time of last trading day or expiration. But with a physically settled contract, like a commodity futures contract or treasuries or, or FX, that physical delivery mechanism affects the timing of the role. Uh, so it's, it's important to be mindful of the type of contract you're dealing with. Uh, here's an example of, uh, and that should say ES, not ED in the title, ESU3, e ESZ, I've, I've got a typo in there. But this is the E-mini S&P uh, from the last quarter. Uh, and you can see as it's a cash settled contract. And you'll notice last trading day being the, the 15th of September over on the far right side of that chart, uh, a very small portion of the open interest was left. Uh, but the, the, the role itself really began only about four or five business days prior to last trading day. Uh, on that Monday, the 11th, of September was when the open interest really began to roll forward in earnest. And you can see by the 13th and the 14th, almost 80 or 85% of it had rolled forward into the deferred December contract. Uh, and this is again, because of uh, being a cash settled contract, there was no risk of delivery. A roll is generally done in a, as a one-to-one -one spread. So if I'm long the September E-mini S&P, and I want to maintain that long position after September 15th, I'm going to execute a calendar spread that involves selling my number of open contracts in September and simultaneously buying the same amount of contracts in the December futures contract. 
Now, in a lot of our products, like the E-mini S&Ps, there's a reduced tick cost or a reduced minimum price increment to execute a role or a calendar spread, which makes that role more efficient to do as a predetermined spread. And because so much of the open interest is rolling forward at the same time, the bid and offer spread is very, very tight. So there's a very, very reduced market impact cost of rolling forward. Now, if we compare this to a physically settled futures contract like the treasuries, this is an example of the 10-year note uh, roll also for that uh, same period, uh, September to December. Notice there's a strikingly different timing here. Uh, the last trading day for the uh, September 10-year note is the 20th of September. That doesn't even appear on the chart because 98% of the open interest has gone forward even before last trading day. And this is because treasuries at the moment are um, under the influence of what's known as negative carry. And because of that, it's expensive for the short position to, main, to, to, to want to wait to make delivery. So a vast majority of the, of the open interest that's going to delivery is being delivered on the first business day of the expiring month. That would be September 1st. So you'll notice that a full week prior to first position day, which in this instance is the 30th of August, 95, almost 98% of the open interest had rolled forward from September to December to completely avoid any optionality on being delivered a physical treasury security. So this underscores the importance of knowing what you want to do with your position, whether the contract is physically or cash settled, and to be mindful of what that first position day in a physically settled contract means in terms of the role and the timing of the role. Uh, so this is a, a concept that's, uh, that's important. I can assure you that the clearing firms are well aware of this risk and will be contacting you in advance to make sure that if you have the wherewithal and you're interested in going to full delivery that you are positioned and ready to take the responsibility for that uh, for that action. Intra-commodity spreads for, or calendar spreads can also be done for strategic purposes. Uh, this is an example of a uh, December to December, December 23 short-term uh, three-month SOFR contract and a December 24 three-month SOFR contract, both of these representing uh, the short-term SOFR interest rates for a, a, a quarter period from December to March 23 to 24 and December 24 to 25. Why would someone trade a calendar spread in an interest rate product like this, where we have multiple contract quarterly contracts listed out over a longer period of time? Well, it has to do with uh, the price relationship between the two periods being considered. In this instance, the activity in the SOFR, three-month SOFR December-December uh, spread from 23 to 24 reflects a point of view about the slope of the yield curve or the slope of the interest rate curve between 2000 and December 2023 and December 2024. As many of you are aware, our central bank, the Fed, has been raising rates for the last 18 months. Uh, the rate of those increases and the size of those increases impacts the slope of the yield curve. So when there are changes, either from economic events like non-farm payroll or CPI, or even things like uh, announcements of treasury issuance that might affect uh, uh, the interest rates in the US, there can be little subtle changes in the slope of the yield curve. A calendar spread like this in a contract with multiple quarterly offerings allows traders to either uh, reduce risk to the changes in the slope of the yield curve or to take advantage of what they perceive to be uh, opportunities in the change in the slope of the yield curve. Uh, as, this, uh, as this was occurring uh, in the spring and summer of this year, we had a bit of a hiccup last March when there was a regional banking crisis in the United States. We had uh, three or four regional banks actually go into bankruptcy and fail. You can see the, the effect on the uh, uh, on the on the outright rates, but also uh, a dramatic change in the spread relationships itself. Um, after that event calmed down in late April, the spread went back to its normal behavior, which in this case 
you'll see a slight degree of steepening in the yield curve from late June to uh, late September. Some of that has just recently reversed uh, as the market's anticipating the Fed may be done raising rates. And in fact, maybe uh, we may be seeing a reduction in, in interest rates as early as the first quarter of next year. Another uh, example of relative value trading uh, could take place in different products. And in this case, I wanna give you an example from the equity index world. CME lists uh, equity index futures on major US benchmark equity indices like the Dow Jones Industrial Average or the three that are represented here. The S&P 500 is clearly the best known and is the one that's used by most institutional and, and broad market participants. Uh, it takes in roughly 80% of the market capitalization of US stock market and that's represented in the blue line. If we look at the orange or gold line, that is the NASDAQ 100, which takes into account the, uh, the NASDAQ's 100 top non-financial uh, companies in large cap weighting. And in the green, it represents the Russell 2000 small cap index. And you can see from the price behavior here, each one is basically pretty highly correlated to each other. They have above a 90% correlation, generally speaking, over long periods of time. But even in spite of that, they also have little differences because of the index construction itself and its constituent members. There are times when the relationship between the indexes gets out of alignment and can provide opportunities to, to capture a relative value or the difference between the indexes themselves. A good example of this was also from last March's uh, it was known as March Madness in the banking area because of the concern about whether banks were properly capitalized and could survive higher interest rates. As you know, some of them didn't. The Silicon Valley Bank, probably the most famous failure, but there were others. There was a signature bank in Boston and, and uh, Republic Bank in California also ended up in receivership and was uh, forced out of business. Uh, what that meant in the equity index space was a dispersion or a difference in the valuation of between the NASDAQ 100 index represented here in the gold line and the Russell 2000 small cap. And it has to do with the, the differences in the constituent constructions of the contracts that affected their pricing behavior. You'll notice that the NASDAQ over this period from March went higher in price, but in a contrasting and different price behavior, the Russell 2000 actually went down in value. Uh, this has to do with the way they're constructed. Uh, I think I missed a slide here. No, here we go. Uh, anyway, someone who was clever enough to buy the NASDAQ futures and sell the equal weighted number of Russell 2000 futures could have captured in a very lower volatility spread relationship the relative difference between the two contracts as they were affected in this activity in March. Another example of intercommodity or, or uh, inter-product spreads based on relative value that could be considered is the relationship between gold and silver, both considered precious metals. Both, however, uh, particularly silver, also have industrial uh, uses. So the relationships, while again, as you can see by the, the depiction here, the gold line representing gold and the sort of grayish line representing silver, the price correlation between gold and silver is generally very high. But there are times in market conditions when either geopolitical or macroeconomic events can affect the, the, the relative value between them favoring one product or the other, depending on what the event is. So many traders or risk managers may use a spread trading strategy to try to capture that relative value going long either gold or going long silver relative to gold. This is an example of the gold silver spread traded on what I would call a dollar neutral basis. In other words, if you take into account the equity value of uh, CME's gold contract, which is based on 100 ounces of gold, and our silver contract, which takes into account 5,000 ounces of silver. If you weight your spread so that the notional equivalent value of each contract is relatively the same, 
you take out a lot of the directional risk in the trade and focus almost exclusively on the relative difference in price terms between the contracts. If we look at this chart, the gold line is just showing that same price of the gold futures contract as a, a point of reference. The green line is showing the spread relationship on a two to three spread basis, two contracts of gold for three contracts of silver. In this, in this instance, long gold, short silver. So you'll notice that uh, beginning on the left in, at the beginning of June, uh, sort of a stable price up down action as you get into July, uh, the spread narrows uh, favoring silver. Uh, as both gold and silver prices went higher uh, on a weighted basis, silver actually outperforming gold at this point. But then as you move gradually to the right end of the chart, you'll notice uh, the spread narrowing a, a little bit as we get into the early part of October, but then a huge difference in, in increase in the spread relationship favoring gold as a result of the conflict uh, in Palestine. So this was an example of that flight to quality or flight to quality assets, risk off trades uh, that favor uh, things like gold, uh, the Swiss franc, the US dollar. Uh, when, when there are geopolitical risks, some of those um, favored things and sometimes even the Japanese yen uh, have favorable uh, price behavior relative to other highly correlated products. So these spread trades can be applied for uh, both trading as well as risk management purposes. We can also conduct spreads. And as I mentioned, we do quite a lot of spread business in our options platform. Remember that options at CME are always options with an underlying position in the futures contract. So if you're long an option at CME and you exercise your rights, it's into a futures position, not into the underlying spot or physical product itself. Uh, the combinations and the different strategies that can be used in option spreads are al almost unlimited. Uh, there are a, a huge number of combinations that can be constructed. Having a little bit of knowledge about how options work is obviously important to coming up with them. And I would highly encourage you to continue your education in, in the use of options because these can be incredibly valuable risk management tools, but also very useful trading vehicles as well. Uh, the thing that sets them apart from futures is that by, when you buy an option, whether it's a put or a call, you have limited risk. Uh, this gives options what's known as an asymmetrical risk reward relationship, and that comes into play very seriously when we look at spreads using options. The other thing that makes them valuable is because some of their premium value is determined by volatility, they can be used to create spread trades that capture or take advantage of rising or falling volatility, as well as creating hedges against increases in volatility. So when we consider or compare options, long positions in particular, against our futures, remember that the futures relationship to profit loss was pretty much linear. If you were long uh, a futures contract and it went up, that was great. But if it went down, you were exposed to unlimited risk. If you're long a call, and you may, re you may remember that a call represents an underlying uh, long market position analogous to a, a long futures position. But if you're long the call, you can participate on, in an unlimited upside price movement, but your loss on the downside is limited to the premium that you pay. This is an example of that asymmetrical risk reward relationship. Likewise, a long put position, which represents a short underlying market position, benefits if the market goes down in price. But if the market goes against you and moves up in price, that long put position loss is limited to the premium paid. So just like with futures contracts, spread positions can be built in options for lots of different reasons, either to create a strategy to limit risk or to manage risk, but also to capture relative value or the perceived opportunities in the underlying marketplace. Generally a spread in an options transaction, and we're gonna be looking at a couple of examples of some relatively simple ones, are thought of in the terms of whether they are what are known as debit spreads or credit spreads. 
a debit spread involving the payment of the premium. A credit spread would be the result of a spread that produces a net premium uh, uh, income. So debit and credit referring to whether you're paying or receiving premium on the spread relationship. Option spreads can be used to express a directional point of view in the underlying futures markets. Bull bear spreads, long short spreads, you might think of them. Uh, to create a directional bias, you can use lots of different things. You could certainly just go long the futures market. Uh, we talked about that at the beginning. You could go long a call. And you, you saw the benefit of that, being able to participate if you're correct in an upward price move, but limiting your loss. Um, but you can also construct uh, positions in spreads that benefit from a bullish or bearish market view. And you would determine whether that spread was bullish or bearish dependent on the position in the net delta. Delta representing the, uh, the impact of the premium to a change in the underlying futures price. So if your net delta is long or, or positive, you've got a positive or a, a bullish market bias. If the spread has a negative net delta, that reflects an, a, a, a bearish market bias or would, would be, uh, would be uh, beneficial to prices dropping in the, in the corresponding futures market. So here's an example of a, what's called a call vertical or a vertical call spread. It involves buying a call near to the money and selling an out of the money. Uh, in the same product in the same expiration month. And it's designed to capture some benefit to an upside price movement to a limited degree, but also limiting the loss to a downside trade. So it's capturing, if you could look at the, at the depiction here, where the zero is in the, like just below the half along the y-axis, the trade benefits as long as prices move higher than 44.60, uh, it has a, a negative influence between 44.60 down to 44 even. And then it, that's, a, that's the extent of the loss. But you'll notice the extent of the gain is limited to roughly 45.50 on the upside. This has to do with the construction of the spread. This is an example of, of a call vertical buying a near to the money uh, S&P 44 even call. Uh, notice that the December futures are roughly at the same price, 44.50. So the 44 even call is at the money. Using a December options expiry with 38 days until expiration, the premium on the at the money is 72 and a half points. And you'll notice its delta is 51. Uh, the gamma is positive, so is the vega. The theta is negative because being long the option exposes the position to time decay. And you'll notice that the, it, each of the strikes has its own volatility. The 45.50 call is considered out of the money because it's above the current market price. And because of that, its premium is less. It's only 15 and a half index points. But notice its delta is also smaller. And since we're selling the 4550 call, we're going to apply the negative functions of its Greeks to the net position. So we, we will pay the 7250 premium on the 44 even call and all of its Greeks in their form are, are applied. The 4550 call that we're selling, we will receive the premium, which reduces our net premium from an outright long 44 call of 72 and a half down to a net premium of 57 index points. So this points out one of the advantages of the call spread is it reduces your premium outlay. It costs less capital to put this trade on. Now, it, everything you do in options, if you're, if you're getting a benefit, you're paying a cost to get it. The cost in this case to the lower premium is it reduces your upside. Because remember, you've got that short out of the money call that limits your upside position, but it also limits your downside risk. So you're getting two things. You're paying less premium for your upside participation, but you're also limiting your potential loss on the downside. The positive net delta, notice that the 18 is subtracted from the 51 because it's a short position. 
results in a positive 33 delta, telling us the trade benefits from rising prices. Uh, you're still positively exposed to rising volatility because the vega is net positive, but you're also exposed to a smaller degree of time decay. Now, I wanted to point out a similar, the same trade, the 44, 45, 50 call vertical, but with a shorter dated option. The fastest growing trading activity in our options franchise is on short dated options, both for trading for risk, but also for risk management purposes. A lot of trading is taking place on what we call short dated options. Options in many cases that have days to trade, a one day, a two day, a three day option. Uh, the shorter you go in time, the lower the premiums, but the shorter you go in time, the higher the, the time decay and the greater the, the gamma or the, the impact to a change in price. So this is the same vertical call spread. Notice the futures at the same price level. So we're dealing with the same call, the at the money 44 and an out of the money 4550, but the premiums are less. The price mitigation is a little bit smaller. It's you, you got a net premium a debit here of, of 42 index points, but notice that the delta is higher. So your change in price is going to, it takes less of a change in price at this point to make back the money. You're still positive Vega and you've got much, much more time decay and it's increasing at an accelerating rate. So for every consideration in a spread like this in options, when you get something like a greater Delta or a lower premium, you're also going to have to pay in terms of time decay as well and maybe lower vega so whenever you get something you've got to you got to pay for it and if you're receiving something you're usually exposed to more risk i mentioned uh at the beginning of the options portion that options premiums are influenced by changes in volatility that also means that we can isolate volatility and trade it as a spread uh the com most common forms of volatility spreads are long and short straddles, long and short strangles. Uh, we can construct things like ratio spreads, which like, like a three to two uh, call spread or uh, put spread, and also what are known as butterflies, which is a spread that involves three or more legs. Uh, and you're going to see uh, an example of that in, in just a few minutes. This is probably the most common. It's the easiest to understand. It's a long straddle. Uh, a long straddle is the simultaneous purchase of a put and call at the same strike price for the same expiry. It usually results in an enormous uh, application of premium to pay. But what it gives you is the ability to capture a significantly big move in underlying price, but be ambivalent to the direction. In other words, if you think there's going to be an economic event, and this could be something like in the financial markets, non-farm payroll, which is re released on the first Friday of the month, or the announcement of CPI or a, a, a GDP number. It could be around a central bank meeting. Uh, it could be around uh, an OPEC meeting in crude. Lots of different economic things that cause uh, rather dramatic and unexpected price moves. A straddle would benefit from that. Uh, what, what, what's important is you may not have to pick the direction. Because if the market blows out one way or the other in a hurry, the straddle position tends to make money and it makes money very quickly. Uh, the problem with a straddle is because you're long both the put and the call, the longer it takes for the market to move, the trade gets consumed in time decay. And you can see the maximum loss is the, as an expiration at the bottom here, at the bottom of that V, is due entirely to time decay if the market doesn't move beyond the cost of the straddle. So a long straddle is both a long put and a long call at the same strike for the same expiration. This is an example of a straddle in gold uh, using the February gold futures as a mark at a price of 1995.3 and the February expiring options that have 79 days to deliver uh, until expiration when I built this slide just a few days ago. You'll notice that the, both the put and the call have the same strike and because of that, they have a very similar premium profile. But in this case, unlike the call vertical, you're buying both. 
So instead of subtracting the one from the other, you're adding them together. The premium is twice as large as an outright position, but that's designed by intention to take advantage of the move in either price direction. The delta is practically zero because what you're long on the call side is being offset by what you're long in the put side. And as a result, everything else doubles in the Greeks. The gamma doubles because you're long both options, the vega doubles because you're long both options, and the time decay doubles because you're long both options. So this is a great concept if you believe there's gonna be a very, very quick move in a very sharp direction, but you don't necessarily want to pick which direction the market goes. And here's the same trade under similar uh, conditions, but for a shorter dated expiration, in this case, December with 20 days to expiration. Notice again, uh, the futures at this price, very close to 1975, which is the at the money strikes, long both the call and the put, doubling the debit, which limits the loss, but increases the cost. You're ambivalent to direction because the delta is neutral and you've got very large gamma and vega, but also even larger time decay because you're closer to expiration and the time decay is increasing at an accelerating rate. So again, you want something in options, you have to pay for it. A butterfly in options is a constructed trade using in this case, three different strikes in the same product for the same expiration, and their distance in strikes is all equivalent. The benefit to this butterfly, this is a long call butterfly, is designed to capture uh, just the opposite move that we just described. Uh, let's say a, a market has moved dramatically, but then settles into a price trading range. And as it settles into that price trading range, the volatility backs off and time decay as you reach closer to expiration accelerates the, uh, the, the falling values of the options premium resulting in a benefit to the short position. So this trade, this long call butterfly takes advantage of declining volatility and time decay. And it's constructed in this example, using gold for December expiration with 45 days, the futures contract at 1941.5, the near to the money or the at the money being the 1940s, you'll notice it's called a butterfly because you've got what's known as a body. That's the at the money middle strike. And then the two wings, uh, the two calls uh, outside, one deeply in the money and one deeply out of the money. Notice they're all equidistant from the body. The out of the money call to the upside is 50 points higher. The in the money call below is 50 points below. And that there are there's two of the body for every one of the wings. That's why it's referred to as a butterfly. Uh, so everything that we're gonna be doing in the table mathematically, the first thing we have to do is double the effects of the body and then do our math on the two different wings. So we're, we're selling two of the at the money calls and we're buying an out of the money call and buying an in the money call, resulting in this case in a net debit. Notice that the debit is smaller than the outright premiums. You're capturing the decay of the body, but you're positioning yourself with lower risk by having long positions in the wings. The delta is zero meaning that you really are ambivalent about price direction here. What you're trying to capture is the time decay and then the falling volatility. And that's expressed in the fact that the spread, if you calculate two times the body and then subtract the individual wings, has a negative vega. That means this trade performs best with falling volatility. It will benefit from declining volatility. And because the theta is net negative, it benefits from time decay. It will be exposed to time decay. And this is the same trade, but for a shorter dated option. Again, you're seeing a very similar pattern only with an acceleration and increase in the theta and also an increase in the net vega. Uh, you get a slightly 
a, a, a different change in the delta, this one expressing a slight negative market directional exposure. Uh, and that has to do with uh, the changes in the delta due to, uh, to the time decay or the shorter dated option. But the concept is the same. You're paying uh, 15 and, and, and 0.1 as a debit, uh, which limits your risk. Uh, you're gonna take advantage of both falling volatility and uh, the decline of, of, of time over, of, of, of time decay, uh, which will be accelerating at an accelerating rate. Uh, that concludes uh, the, the, the prepared part of the presentation. I wanted to leave you, and you'll get copies of this deck if you request it, uh, some links to potential resources that are available at cmegroup.com. Uh, the futures spread overview, uh, some more inf information about metals intramarket spreads, equity intermarket spreads that we talked about. And if you're interested in the, in the crude oil market, an explanation of what's known as the crack spread, which takes crude oil and breaks it into some of its refined products. That is a much more industrial or commercial type spread. There are also crack spreads in soybeans as well. Uh, and then uh, of course, if, if you need more information, please check out our uh, educational portal at cmegroup.com. It's under the education dropdown. And you can, of course, uh, uh, contact me via email if you've got any individual questions. But Mark, why don't we pause now uh, for any comments or questions that you might have received in the chat? Awesome, <clears throat> awesome stuff, thank you. Um, I was gonna ask you about the crack spread, actually. Um, I mean, from from your um, um, uh, presentation, you're mentioning the the shorter dated options. It's def definitely something which um, we're seeing. We're seeing a lot of popularity in <clears throat> the ability to kind of choose a specific date for the expiration of options in gold or the S and P. Um, <clears throat> I was wondering if, from your pit days, you remembered the um, hand signals for the for a butterfly. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I was I was uh, long gone before we got to most of that stuff, but uh, okay. the hand signals have have really have really become a, a a nostalgic thing. But yes, there were all kinds of you could have a full conversation and and and, and never open your mouth down there because it was so loud and so noisy. It was but you know, to do a cross pit transaction, there was no way to be heard or to hear what was being said. So it was all done through uh, different different hand gestures. And so forth, but uh, no, I'm afraid I don't, Mark. But that's a uh, thank you for asking. <laughs> um, okay, we, we've got a, a question here. What, uh, what are the key factors to consider when choosing prices and expiration dates for a calendar spread? And uh, what are the most common mistakes do you think that uh, spread traders would make? Well, with respect to a roll, remember what the what the purpose of the roll is. Uh, and I know that there's there's uh, there have been uh, in in different media. You're trying to evaluate the value of the the roll spread itself from a uh, from a economic or a mathematical point of view to determine when you should roll. But I would say from a practical standpoint, remembering that if your goal is to maintain that open position, what really matters to you is getting the roll done before you're at risk in a physically delivered contract of that early delivery but also to capture the liquidity when it's at its peak, which is you roll when everybody else rolls because that's when the spread itself has got the tightest bid and offer spread. If your valuation says you're off by an eighth of a minimum tick increment in terms of value, I can assure you, you should care less about that than being able to roll forward when it's efficient because if the bid and offer spread goes from a half of a minimum tick increment to a full increment, you've just surrendered any relative value that you thought you were gonna get by hanging on to the bid side. Uh, so from a practical standpoint, uh, I would suggest that you evaluate the timing of the roll to roll when the, the, the majority of the open interest is going at the same time. And we do have some tools on the website on certain products called pace of the roll. Uh, that show you when this occurs. And it's driven by what we covered in today's program. If it's a physically settled contract, beware of first position day. Most of the open interest will roll prior to that. If it's cash settled, you can 
pretty much uh, because you're not going to be affected long or short with an early delivery option. Uh, you, you can pretty much roll when it's most efficient, which is when the, the open interest is going, but you can be less particular about that. Uh, and as a cash settled contract, there could be, uh, depending on the uh, what the trade was put on against, there could be financial reasons to want to accept the cash settlement. But uh, for most roles, you want to go, it's about timing, not about pricing. Um, and you'll get the tightest bid and offer spreads in many cases with a reduced minimum tick increment than the outrights by doing it uh, at the peak of the roll period. I hope that addresses the question and thank you for asking it. No problem at all. Um, I, I just wondered if um, you, you showed us there the kind of long um, straddle rolls there. And any other kind of long volatility um, options strategies that you would um, highlight? Well, probably the, 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 the second most popular would be what's known as a strangle. A long strangle is a is a net debit spread. It involves this. It's similar to the straddle, only you're long both a put and a call, but you're out the money. You're you're in other words, the, the straddle straddles the at the money price, and it 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 takes advantage of a of a real big price explosion in either direction. A strangle takes advantage of a price a big price move, but is designed to cost less and have uh, a lower uh, negative impact to time decay because you're buying a deep out of the money put and a deep out of the money call. It still takes a significant price movement and the sooner it takes place, the better. Uh, but the the negative effects of uh, of it are, are, are uh, reduced because you're further out. Uh, it costs you less. It also takes a bigger move to get paid. So there are lots of different ways. There are ways of expressing long volatility in certain butterfly or uh, uh, ratio spreads. All of them can be determined by whether you want to take more price directional risk, which means that you could design the trade to have a positive or a negative net delta. Uh, and what you want if you're trying to capture rising volatility is to make sure that your negative, uh, that your net delta, net net vega is positive, uh, because if if volatility goes up and you've got a negative net vega, you're not going to enjoy the benefit. So having a little bit of understanding about what the Greeks signify and how they can be used in combinations, uh, there's lots of different ways to do that. But the most common volatility spreads are straddles and strangles and maybe uh, ratio spreads and certain butterfly trades. There are also spreads known as condors, which involve four legs, Christmas trees that can have anywhere from six to eight different legs. Those are what we used to call broker's dreams because of the execution costs and commissions on them were so big. Uh, the broker was the better benefit than the, uh, than the trader, <laughs> but uh, uh, it all depends on what you're trying to achieve. And your net position is what tells you where your risk is, but also where your benefit is. Mm, good stuff. Thank you. Um, we have another question. <clears throat> what are vertical spreads and how do they work with respect to options? Uh, re re I'm sorry, say that again, Mark. Sorry, what are vertical spreads and how do they work ah. with respect to options? A vertical refers to a directional spread. So it, a call vertical benefits generally a long call vertical benefits from higher prices. You can also be short a call vertical, which benefits from lower prices. You can be long a put vertical, which benefits from lower prices. You can be short a put vertical, which benefits from higher prices. What the, or, or the, the, the difference between the, the long and short verticals usually applies to whether you're paying premium or receiving premium. Now, remember, in an option spread like that, a long vertical where you pay the premium generally results in limited loss to the trade. But if you're in a receiving premium trade, there is a tendency for those to have unlimited risk. You collect the premium. In many cases, it could be a large premium. But in exchange for that premium, you're assuming 
uh, a very large amount of price risk. Now that price risk could be offset with a delta hedge in futures. It might be put on against a physical position. You know, one never knows, and that's why these things can be beneficial. But if you're in a vertical spread that is a premium receiving or a credit spread, be mindful that that trade could also be exposed to much higher levels of risk than a debit spread where your risk is limited to what you pay. Uh, so it depends on the construction of the vertical to arrive at its benefit and its cost in terms of risk. Excellent stuff. Thanks very much. Um, I think we're about coming to the end now. So um, thank you very much, David. Thank you very much, everyone, for uh, joining. And um, I'd just like to invite um, APM's SEO, Nick, just to um, have a few closing words. Thanks. Over to you, Nick. Thanks, Mark. Uh, well, once again, thank you very much, David. Very informative, very educational. Uh, thank you for the CME group. And to keep it very short and brief, I'd just like to wish everyone a very happy Diwali um, because it's that time of year. Um, so thank you very much. Obviously, we have the in-person um, seminar coming up in two weeks' time. So if you haven't yet registered for it, please register and we look forward to seeing you in person in two weeks' time. Thank you very much, everybody, for attending. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Nick. And thank you, Hitachi, for putting all of this together. And thank you all for your patience and interest today. Look forward to uh, engaging with you in the future. Have a very good day. Thanks, so. Hey guys, are we all ready? Good, I'm gonna admit people and we can start. Good afternoon.